All right, so uh, Labor Day weekend. I ask you this question. Do you, ever, do you ever get tired just thinking about what's on your to-do list for the week ahead? And before, before you even start into the list, you just feel like, oh, man, I, I'm, a, I, I'm at the end and I'm just uh, beginning. You ever find yourself on Monday morning when you get up and start the regular routine, you realize, I'm, I'm as tired right now and battle-worn as when I, I left work on Friday afternoon. Do you ever bring home lots of work uh, over the weekend so you can catch up on all the things you weren't able to get done during the week? When, when you're cut off from your uh, electronics, your, your computer, your, your phone, your pad, do you start getting shakes? Like you're having withdrawal symptoms of some kind? Do you feel guilty whenever you find yourself relaxing? On a Labor Day weekend, we're going to look at what God says about taking a day off. And the sermon title is A Word for Workaholics. And uh, wouldn't you agree that workaholism, being obsessed with work, can become a detriment to, to family life? I think it, it damages marriages, I think it damages families, damages health. And so God recognizes our tendency to lean in that way. And the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments deals with taking a day off. So I invite you to open your Bibles to the second book of the Bible, Exodus, Genesis, then Exodus. Exodus 20 is one of two places where you'll find a listing of the Ten Commandments. And uh, Exodus 20, you want to read the fourth commandment today. It's interesting to me in looking at these commandments that out of the ten, God has more to say about this particular thing, taking a day off, than He says, way more than He says about murder or adultery. It's the longest of the ten, and it's if He's saying, I really want you to take this seriously. Don't, don't just write this off. Don't say, oh, well, that's probably for somebody, but it's not for me. It's not a suggestion. He's saying, I am I'm really leaning into this, commanding you to take this day off every week. Very clear in his word. Here's what it says, beginning in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it, you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. I think God anticipated that people would come up with a lot of excuses. But, well, but what about, and how about this? Okay, he just wanted to cover a lot of bases. For in six days, the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea and all that's in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. So what's God talking about here? What does Sabbath mean? Sabbath means day of rest. God says every seventh day you're to take a day of rest. And and why? Jesus said this. He said the Sabbath was made for man, not man, for the Sabbath. So God says, this is a gift for you. This isn't isn't just about me, uh, although it's always uh, a lot about God. He says, I'm doing this for your benefit. And the purpose of the Sabbath day is, is to keep us from, from burnout, keep us from, uh, from just running out of gas. Every seven days, you need to get physically, emotionally, spiritually recharged because your batteries run down. And he says, I'm doing this for your benefit. This is the antidote to burnout. It's the prevention against living in a stress-filled world. And God says, every seven days, I want you to do this. Now, I want to tell you this right up front. I'm planning these sermons out months in advance. I have a completed message weeks and weeks in advance. And I have known this message is coming for, for a long time. And uh, out of all the things that I would ever preach about, this is, this is one that I am maybe the most least qualified person in the room to do. Because, because I work on Sunday. Now, I'll tell you in a minute, you got to set aside another day when you work on Sunday. Uh, I need a Sabbath on another day, and I always intend to. But I have this 
inclination, a struggle in my spirit. There's always one more call to make, one more visit. There's always something else I can do. And I'm doing it for the Lord, so I ought to be able to work it in somehow and before long. Uh, That Sabbath day just gets sucked away from me. And I'm going to tell you uh, how that's worked for me this week uh, here in just a minute. Now, so I love preaching sermons that are about me and my sin. And that's what you got today. When is this Sabbath day? Well, is it Sunday? Is it Saturday? Is it Friday? And uh, I think the Bible ultimately says it doesn't matter. The answer is one day a week. God doesn't care when you do it, but there needs to be a time when you do it every week. God commanded, nowhere does, in the Bible does God command it has to be on Sunday. And so why are we here, all of us gathered together on this Sunday in the Lord's house? Well, In the New Testament, the first Christians that were coming out of a Jewish background where Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, was precious to them. They protected it. After Jesus was raised from the dead, they started moving towards Sunday to celebrate that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's a big deal. And so they started having their gatherings on Sunday. John in the Revelation, he refers to to Sunday as the Lord's Day. And so things had just shifted towards Sunday. And that's why today most believers, not all, uh, celebrate their Sabbath day on Sunday. But I want to be clear about it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17 tells us that a Christ, as a Christian, you're no longer tied down to which day you celebrate. Not it has to be this day, it has to be that day, and arguing about those things. It, it, it chastises people who do that. Paul says to the church at Rome, one person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. You do what God's called you to do, but you don't give up the day. You don't violate this fourth commandment. Some people spiritualize this, and I've heard this before. Well, I don't really need a set-aside day with the Lord because I'm just worshiping God every day. Well, no, you're not. You, you know good and well you're not. There needs to be one particular day. Now, you ought to be, wor- worship's part of my day every day. I'm going to spend time in God's Word. I'm, but there's one day that's set aside that is a unique day in God's plan for us. And we're to protect it and care for it. And we're to live it. Saying every day is your Sabbath day is like saying, well, this job is everyone's job. Well, the job that's everyone's job is no one's job. Many of you know that. Uh, it's not signed to a particular person, to a particular purpose, a particular place. So, same true in worship. God picked a special day. And God says, you need to pick a day out of the week where you're going to rest. You're going to have some recreation, maybe. You're going to be able to do some restoration, some worship, recharge yourself. God wants you to do it. Now, what do you do with your Sabbath day? And I want to make this as simple as possible. How do you keep it holy? Uh, It should be a holy day. God made the day holy. How do you make it holy? Holy means set apart. That it's, it's different. It's not like every other day of your week. That's what it means to have a Sabbath day. It doesn't just look like the rest of the days. Except maybe you take an hour or two to come to church. There are other things that come with the day that is called the Sabbath day. You do things differently. You do the other six days of the week. On the seventh day... You have a change of pace, and God wants us to use this Sabbath, your day, at least once a week, to rest, to recharge, to refocus. And I want to break that out. Here's the first thing. God says, use the Sabbath day to rest my body. Psalm 127 says, it's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. God says, I want you to be rested. Your body needs rest. And this is so important that God used himself as an example. That God created the heavens and the earth, is what uh, Moses records for us in Exodus 20. And on the seventh day, he rested. Now, was God just so bone tired he had to take a day off? Well, no, God does not get tired. He is God. But he used himself as the perfect example of setting aside one day. And he set aside a day to rest, modeling something, a principle of life. Every seven days you take a day off. Now, the, the great part about this for me is that if, and, and you need to latch hold of this, that you have, a, you have a biblical foundation for a Sunday afternoon nap. 
you do not have to justify this. You don't have to manipulate your family on this. You, you know, God's Word. That's, i got to stand on God's Word. I'm taking my afternoon nap. You have a biblical basis for an afternoon nap. It, it's fascinating to me that in this world in which we live, there are more labor-saving devices than there have ever been before, and more people are working harder and longer hours than ever before. There's more stress. There's more pressure. There's more burnout. Two of my favorite quotes about this. One says, if you're burning the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. The other one says, you can have so many irons in the fire that you are putting out the fire. You need to take a day of rest. And you, you can become so quickly consumed by your career. And, and there, are, there are a lot of magnetic things about work that draw us in and make it hard to break free from this. There, there are things built into it. You want more money or recognition or promotion or a sense of fulfillment or achievement or accomplishment. And it seems to be more measurable to receive those things than maybe the day of rest is and measurables. And all these powerful forces are working against us all the time to say you need to work more. You need to work harder. You need to spend more time with work. And you become addicted to work and your body is not built for nonstop work. Whatever you do for a living, you need to stop one day a week. Uh, th this, is, this is a tough one. And not check my email. My email. And, and not uh, come to the office. Just in case they might need me for something. On my day off. My Sabbath day. Uh, we, think, we think we get more done by continuing to drive forward. And you know how this is. Uh, and... Some of you have had this experience. I've had this experience. I'm working on a lot, a lot of my stuff that I do. If it's a sermon or it's, it's something on the administrative side of my work, you have a project, and just to keep pressing forward and keep pressing forward and keep looking at that computer screen and keep fighting through and not getting up and keep pushing, 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 and you realize this is not productive at all. There's nothing happening here. I'm not moving anything. And uh, efficiency experts, you know, and I read a lot of books and a lot of business-related stuff, the efficiency folks. So I'm always trying, how can I get more out of my day? And they say, well, you need more rest. You need breaks in the scheme of things to be more effective, more efficient, more productive. And you're always going to beat out the person who works continually and constantly. When you follow God's plan, isn't it amazing how often God's plan actually works? Psalm 23, this became uh, personal for me this week. Uh, Psalm 23 teaches, the Lord is my shepherd. And it says, he makes me lie down, green pastures. This is my question for you. Has God ever made you lie down? Yeah. Uh, this week, I, I, I know that a productive week for me, this is my personal testimony stuff, that I'm pretty healthy and I'm going well at about 50 hours a week. Somewhere in that range. That fits me pretty well. If I go over 60, I start feeling it. I feel it at home. I feel it in my body. Uh, things things start, to, start to break down for me. And, uh, you know, do the math. Try to keep up with it on a weekly basis. But see, I thought, but I'm me. I can do this. And so I ran about three weeks in a row where I'm, I'm up in the 60 range. And then... Last Sunday, before, between the two services, I realized my, my left side's on fire because my shingles came to visit me again. Because by the second service, man, uh, I mean, I made it through your service for the most part. Second service, I was miserable. Uh, feeling, uh, feeling like I was about to I don't know, maybe, I wonder if I can function with one kidney. I don't know what was going on for sure, but uh, well, I was miserable. And this last week, there were things I continued to do, but God, God just made me lie down for a few days this last week because I didn't have enough sense to do it myself. Sometimes this is how God works things. He'll make you lie down in the green pasture. So, I've discovered that uh, workaholics who never take a few days off, uh, and I've known, I've known folks for years that uh, maybe they'll, they'll observe it by uh, taking a couple of weeks in the hospital somewhere. 
You say, but when I relax, I feel guilty. Well, you don't need to feel guilty. Jesus, nobody did more. Nobody's days were more full than Jesus. But Jesus, he always protected that Sabbath day. He did this. He, he, he never missed the Sabbath. God the Father, creator of the universe, he, he in six days created the heavens and the earth. In the seventh day, he rested. So here's the question for us. Who do you think you are? That you, you're, you're, are you so important? Am I so important that the world will just stop spinning on its axis unless I am, uh, am doing these things? You can resign. I'll give you permission here. You can resign as general manager of the universe because it's not going to fall apart. And a reluctance, reluctance to rest is a sign of immaturity and insecurity. When, when you're immature, you don't like to rest. You have young children, and you're trying to put them to bed at night. How does that work? Well, they'll put it off. They'll complain about it. They'll pull against it. No, I don't want to. I want to stay up, and I want to drink a water. And they'll just put layers. Of, and you know why they don't want to go to bed when it's time to go to bed? Because they're immature. And so as a good parent, you, you, you enforce a bedtime because you know they're just going to be a mess the next day. If, if they don't go to bed when they're supposed to. And we'll get aggravated with a young child over that, and yet we'll do it to ourselves, and we're worthless the next day. Sometimes God will make you lie down in a green pasture. But I have to get all this done, and I don't... It, God says, I'm not worried too much about your deadline, but every seventh day, you need to listen to what I'm saying, because otherwise things will begin to unravel for you. The second thing, God really wants, God, God wants me to, to recharge my, my emotions. And when uh, a while back I was doing something at the gym and forgot that I'm in my 50s and not in my 20s, and it, I had to stop doing some stuff for a while to, to heal up because I forgot uh, I, I'm elderly and decrepit now and and but but continuing to do what I'd been doing, I wasn't going to heal up. I was going to stop doing what I was doing. See, so you, you you know that in your body, but but you can get uh, in in your emotional makeup, in in your mental uh, drive, you can start running on thin ice, and you have to shut that down too. And you have to you have to get the Sabbath in that side of you too to heal up and to. To be back to full strength again. Because work stress uh, drains you. Rest can take care of some physical fatigue. But not that emotional fatigue. And so uh, we just need, uh, we need regular doses of inspiration and encouragement. There's a, a historical reference. In the French Revolution. They were trying to throw out all the old laws. And one of the laws was we shut down the country on Sunday. And during the French Revolution, they said, well, that's one of the law. We're getting rid of that. This is ridiculous. We ought to work seven days a week. And it was only a couple of months, and they rescinded that particular law because they said th the people in France were falling apart. Society was beginning to unravel when they took away that one day. So how do you do this? Uh, three things that are, are universal to build into your Sabbath day, and if that's on Sunday or wherever that is. Here's the first one. Include time for quietness. Uh, David wrote, He leads me beside the still waters, the quiet waters. He restores my soul. Quietness and soul restoration go hand in hand. We're, we're, we're in this world that is so full of noise, and we're used to having the noise with us all the time. And as long as you have a phone with you, you always, there's always opportunity for more input and, and more information and more sound. And the Bible says, be still. This is God speaking. Be still and know that I am God. You need to schedule quiet in your life. 
And you have to schedule or it doesn't happen. Get alone with God and get quiet. Many people use the whole weekend to, to relax, to recreate, but, but they never have any quiet. And then they don't know why. They're still stressed and weary when it's time to go back to work on Monday. One of my favorite references to uh, this particular point uh, came out of the early part of the last century. Missionaries were trying to, to get into the African continent. And it was a dark and dangerous place, and, uh, especially getting into the interior. And so in the Congo, uh, this missionary had hired a safari guide. He had hired porters to carry everything they had. They had to haul it in themselves. And so he'd hired all these people. So they're making their way through the jungles. And, and he was pressing forward because the missionary knew we need to get to this spot. And as soon as we can get there, the sooner we can get started. And uh, all these folks who had been hired to carry all the stuff, boxes and supplies, and resource, food. One morning he woke up and uh, came out of his tent. He looked around. Nothing was moving in the camp. Everyone was all laid back. Most of them still asleep. Sun was already, already up. No one had to, uh, come by to wake him up. He said, what's going on? And the safari guide said this, we're going to rest today so that our souls can catch up with our bodies. So that our souls can catch up with our bodies. You ever felt that way? You're speeding through life, and you just need to stop and let your soul catch up with your body. You do that in periods of quietness. Second thing, include time for your family. In American history, Sunday has historically been a day for two things, for your church, for your family. And I think that's still a good idea. God wants you to plan special time with your family to do things. They're going to draw your family together. And this is, this is different, though, than using your Sabbath to run from, from one activity to another, to bigger and better entertainment so that you, you're just chasing each other all weekend long, all Sabbath long. It's being together, and it's talking with one another, and it's loving one another. As a family, it's Focusing on God and focusing on the things of God. And by the way, your children know whether or not your Sunday is about God or not. Wait until Wednesday and say, what's the most important thing about Sunday for our family? And see what they say. They say, oh, because we, we run here, we go there, we do this. Does God show up in that conversation with your children? They know. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. These words that I command you today, be on your heart. Teach them diligently to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You should bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. That that God talk should be the continuous conversation in your home. And especially should that be true on the Lord's Day, regardless of how old your children are. Third thing, include time for fellowship. You need time with other believers. We draw strength from being together. We're going to talk significantly in the series just before us to be the church series about community and the importance of it. The Bible says, not neglecting to meet together as, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. When we get together, we encourage each other. And that's why David says in Psalm 122, I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. He, he was looking forward to the time when he would gather with God's people to worship the Lord. He said, I look forward to it. And why? Because there's a rejuvenation that happens in our spirit when we get together with other believers. Because it's tough being a believer out there. And many of you, I know, you, you're in places where you're really isolated from spiritual things in your workplace. Uh, in, your, in your neighborhood, you may be the only believer there. And we need each other to encourage and uplift one another and inspire one another and challenge one another in the faith. It is, it is rare that uh, a week goes by that someone doesn't say, yeah, I wasn't planning to come to church today. I was tired, didn't feel well, had so much work to catch up on, thought I'd just have time to you know, just don't have time this week to go to church, but I decided to come anyway, and, and I'm so glad I did, because 
because I was encouraged and blessed and strengthened and all those good things that happen when God's people get together with God's people. You get rejuvenated, recharged, rebuilt by being with other people. I looked in uh, the, the ESV version. Paul said that, he says this five different times, five different places. I was refreshed by being with other believers. And that's my experience when I'm with other believers. I, there's something that just washes, washes away uh, a lot of bad stuff and, and refreshes me with some good stuff when I'm with God's people. Third thing, use the Sabbath to refocus my spirit. And I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. It means to tune into God. The psalmist wrote, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. And, and every, Sunday is preeminently a day of worship. To focus on God. Not, okay, this segment of, of the Sabbath day is about God and then we can check the God box and we can go on to all the other things on the activity list. But it needs to be a God day all day in whatever ways you can construct that. It's a time to remember what's important. A time to, a time to get a spiritual tune-up. That, that whole thing of bowing down, uh, which is what the word worship means, to bow down. It, it, I don't know, maybe we should do more bowing down physically bowing down to say, I may never be able to get back up today, but I'm going to go do this. To bow down is to acknowledge that God's God and I'm not in, in, a, in a physical way. To, to acknowledge His, gra- His glory, His power, His creation, His grace. To, 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 to acknowledge He's really in charge and I'm not. And if we don't get to that, if we don't get to that spot, we, we've missed out on something God really wants us to know. The body and your life needs to be recalibrated about every seven days, according to God's plan. You need to be focused again, and that's what worship does. It, it brings focus to what's really important. We, we do this to practice for the rest of the week. We do this just to be reminded at least once a week that God's in charge, that God is God, that, that we're not God, that, that He should be a part of everything every day, and we need this time to get that set. The tragedy is a lot of people take a day off, and they use it for their physical needs, and they rest, and emotional needs, and recreation relationships, but they ignore their most important need, that spirit gets empty, and it needs to be refilled with God's presence, and God's power, and God's love, and an awareness that He's with you all week long. America, as a general rule, has turned Sunday into fun day. We've taken a holy day and turned it into a holiday, and most people we know don't worship God on Sunday. And here's where it becomes a problem. If if all you ever do is work and play, pretty soon you start to think that all there is to life is work and play. And God has a much bigger eternal plan for you than that. Jesus said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? God wants you to ask that question every seven days. That, okay, so I... Here, here's what my Monday through Friday, Monday through Saturday, whatever your work week looks like, here, here's what that was like this last week. So I look at those hours, and I say, what am I exchanging my life for? What, was that, was it, just, was it just to make money for me or the company I work for? Or was there something more eternal about it than that? And there can be much more eternal things about it than just just a dollar sign. What am I exchanging my life for? God wants us on a weekly basis to stop and re-examine. Where are my priorities? Uh, To reevaluate, regroup, relax, uh, to tune into God, listen to Him. Get your perspective right. Get your priorities rebalanced. Refocus on God every seven days. And I'm saying this, refocus my spirit. 
Worship is the first thing you ought to do on your day off, your Sabbath day, before you do all the others. Because what happens is if you, you say, yeah, I'm going to get around to that God part of it, but I have this long list of other things, the long list of other things will squeeze God completely out of that day. For families, uh, your faithfulness at worship is a good example that you model to your children. Uh, of course we're going to church. The most dangerous thing that families can do in relationship to God's day is to wake up on Sunday morning and then to be making the decision. Are we going to go to church today? Yes, we are. That question's already answered, isn't it? That's right. It has to be answered up front. Uh, uh, Rhonda's taught uh, parenting in the pew and how to do this better as a parent and and you ought to lay out clothes for those kids on Saturday night because you know and they know we're going to church tomorrow. We're going to make some preparations ahead of time. Uh, Rhonda with our kids, breakfast was always special on Sunday mornings because Sunday was a special day. And uh, it just needs to be settled up front. Every seven days you're going to worship. And you need to understand, you don't teach values to your children. You model values to your children. They know what's important to you. That that thing where you say, well, in my my economy of things, God's first, family's second, and then, I don't know, bluebell ice cream's third, whatever your third thing is, whatever the high priority, beef jerky, whatever's on that list, my random uh, thought process, don't know what word will come out next, so I'll stop there. But is it really? Is it really? It's one thing to say that, but it is quite another thing to, to model that to your children so they know, they know. And when the excuses start coming, well, we're tired today. We have extra work. We're just not going to go today. When you model an inconsistency to your family, uh, you, you create... Why is, why is a younger generation less likely today to go to church than they were a couple generations ago? And much of it comes back to, to parents who, who didn't think it was a big deal to, to make a sporadic uh, engagement with God's people on God's day, uh, make that their pattern for life. Every seven days... You rest, you recharge, you refocus. Is my work or my worship the most important thing in my life? Also, if you keep a regular habit of church attendance, your Sabbath day, this is one part, you may not. We're going to encourage you and we're going to keep on hammering this. You ought to be reading God's Word every day. You ought to be spending a little bit of time in prayer. We're we're going to try to work to build that daily habit into into us and our Be the Church emphasis. That's what that little devotional book is about. It's about building a habit that's going to carry forward for a long time beyond 30 days of uh, devotionals. But if, if, if you're not to that spot yet, if you'll at least be in God's house on God's day, recognizing His Sabbath day, you'll at least never get more than seven days away from thinking about God. You may not think about him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, but if you're back on Sunday, he's back on the radar again. He's back on the menu again. He, he's a part of your process again. And you don't want to get more than seven days away from God. And I've seen it happen way too many times because I've been at this for too long with too many people that, yeah, well, okay, there is a, there's a good reason for this Sunday that you're doing something else and this Sunday that you're doing something else. And before long, it's six months, and it's six years, and it's 20 years of being away from God and away from the things of God, and God's not on the radar anymore. When you buy a car, they give you a book with a maintenance schedule in it. It says, this is what you should do to take good care of your car, and if you'll do this, it'll, it'll run the way it's supposed to run. It'll work the way it's supposed to work. Life will uh, go according to my plan. Car will last. The owner's manual for your life is the Bible, and God says this maintenance schedule for living, every seventh day you slow down, you stop, you regroup, and you spend time in worship. And you, these things recharge you emotionally and physically, and you do that, you're going to be far more successful, and you'll last a whole lot longer than any other way. 
The lifestyle that Jesus offers is not a difficult life. It just makes so much sense. He knows, he's the creator, right? He knows how you're made. He knows how you work. He knows how it's supposed to work. When you do it God's way, you're going to benefit. When you don't follow God's principles, when you don't have Christ at the center of your life, the manager calling the shots, one of the clearest signs of that, uh, your priorities get all out of order. And you're chronically fatigued. And I'm not talking about a physical ailment, but, but, but heart weary. And you're out of balance. So what do you do when you are in that situation? Uh, For me this week, I just came back to God again as I've come back to Him periodically to recalibrate, to say, God, I want you to take all these parts of my life that uh, spread me too thin, and I want you to help me sort some things out, sort some things out that if I drop this and I let this go so I can focus on the big things that can't be let go, just help me to figure that out. I need you to be the, the all-out manager of how I'm doing life. And Jesus said, if you'll do that, come to me, all who are weary, labor, and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest for your souls. Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Jesus said, if you're carrying a heavy burden today, you're carrying one that He doesn't want you to be caring. You're trying to be God. Let God be God and you be you. And God God works a great plan when we do it that way. I want to challenge you to take this commandment seriously. This is not a negotiable. It's not an option. And, And if you don't do this, you're going to pay for it eventually. And this is a great part about this is that as it says... His yoke is easy and his burden is light. God says, I'm I'm doing this for your benefit because I love you. Because I know what's best for you. I know how to make your life more full, more complete, and more productive. And things are going to last beyond beyond the next paycheck. Labor Day.